Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to today's webcast session, Reuse It or Lose It, where we will talk about how reuse can ensure true circularity for valuable resources. My name is Mitu Moran, and I have the honor of moderating the session today. I think we can all agree that we need to transform to a circular economy sooner rather than later. Until now, we've been focusing on recycling, which of course is an important part of the equation, but we need to move up on what we call the resource hierarchy. And one of those areas we need to move up on is the focus of today's webcast, and that is reuse. Joining me today are Gia Seta, Senior Vice President and Head of Reuse at Tomra. Since joining Tomra in 1995, he has led several technology development initiatives, which have proven to set new industry standards. Yeah, welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, me too. Thanks for having me here. Also joining Gea yeah, is Andy Grant, technical director at Unomia. With many years of experience in waste collection and the consultancy industry, Andy's core expertise covers all aspects of waste collection and the sorting and marketing of dry recycling. Andy, likewise, welcome to you. Thank you, me too. Looking forward to the discussion. I think it'll be a good one. Joining us later today is Simon Rosso, Project Manager, Circular Packaging Systems, Municipality of Aarhus in Denmark. So let's get started. Gea, I'd like to start with you. What is the status quo today? Yeah, thanks, uh, me too. I think you are totally right regarding moving up the, the resource hierarchy. You know, the truth is that recycling alone uh, cannot provide the necessary transition to a, um, a sustainable future. We need uh, more. So uh, reuse systems, um, for example, for takeaway food and drinks packaging is not only a, a method to um, reduce uh, littering uh, and pollution, but it's also a, a way to reduce the uh, um, CO2 footprint of this uh, packaging industry. Uh, so we think establishing attractive, efficient uh, systems for uh, reusable packaging for takeaway food and drinks is a key contributor to the circular uh, economy. And, you know, reusable packaging can mean a lot. Uh, but what we have decided to focus on is reusable packaging for, for takeaway food and drinks, um, mainly because that's where we see um, the possibility for a very high and, and, and significant impact uh, from an environmental perspective. So, you know, in our constant search for uh, consumer convenience, we have created mountains of, of litter. Just look at, uh, go into the city uh, a little late on a Saturday evening, uh, and you will see a lot of, of litter around, uh, and often you see litter bins uh, overflowing. So that is a situation we are determined to do something with. So typically, uh, uh, our European consumer today consumes, um, yeah, statistics say actually more than 200 disposable packages um, from takeaway food and drinks annually. That, that's, that, that that's was a, a surprise. That's a lot. I was surprised. And, and this also explains why um, uh, as much as 40 to 50 percent of the litter you find in in public waste bins in cities consists of this takeaway packaging. And you know, often this packaging is not ending up where it should be in in waste bins, but it's littered. Um, mm. And if it is collected in waste bins, it's today normally not recycled. And of course, to, to manage all this waste also um, has a significant uh, cost. A cost which is more and more uh, transferred to, to businesses, cafes, restaurants, that industry which is using the, the, um, the single-use packaging. 
to to more reflect uh, all the um the societal cost related to 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 this packaging type and okay so this is what's happening on on the business side of things is anything happening on the policy side of things it is it is actually uh so we see quite some initiatives uh on eu level uh, for example in the in the packaging packaging waste directive which is now um, being revised, we see, see uh, initiatives and targets for, for usable packaging. However, we also see a lot of, of um, developments in different countries. Take France, for example. From 1st of Jan this year, the whole quick serve restaurant industry um, ha now has to use only reusable packaging for dine in um, applications. So this means that Burger King, McDonald's, and these guys. Uh, now have uh, stopped using single-use packaging uh, for dine-in, and, and then are you started have started to use um, um, reusable packaging. Uh, we also see that in Germany, um, um, cafes, restaurants, uh, businesses providing fresh cut, cut food and drinks, um, they now have to offer reusable packaging as an alternative to the consumer. The same. Uh, legislation is, as in Germany, is now kicking in 1st of Jan next year in, in Sweden. In Denmark, we know that um, they will introduce their uh, extended producer responsibility um, legislation 1st of January 2025. And rumors uh, say that there will be um, a fee or a tax on, on single-use uh, takeaway packaging to, to disincentivize the use of it. And there are the rumors are talking about as uh, you know um, a 20 cent uh, fee that is not confirmed at all but at least yeah. that's uh, that's current rumors uh, it'll be exciting to see what, what what it ends up with and also portugal has has uh, introduced um, uh, a tax on single use uh, aluminum and plastic um, packaging for takeaway so yes quite a lot of initiatives uh, on the legislative uh, side and that is really needed um, to to uh, make um, reusable packaging in the norm and not only the exception we need incentives clearly so it sounds to me like the time is right now i think the time is certainly right to develop attractive efficient uh, systems based on reusable packaging yes and that's why Tomra strategically have has decided that this is something we would like to contribute to. So walk us through that, Gea. What is Tomra thinking? Yeah. So what we are working on is a circular solution based on reusable takeaway packaging. Uh, the user journey uh, will start in the same way as with single-use packaging. The, the consumer gets his food or drinks from a restaurant cafe, consumes it wherever he or she is, in the park, in, at university, uh, at work, etc. But here in, in, in this solution, the packaging is of course not uh, disposed into a bin, but rather returned to a collection point, um, which should be where where you uh, are. So where you live, where you work, uh, in the park, where you are, maybe on a on a Sunday, nice Sunday, or um, uh, the packaging should be returned to, for example, to to the cafe restaurant where you got the, the food or, or drinks. A part of the system we are offering is also a logistical solution where the packaging is picked up um, from the, these collection points and brought to a sanitization hub where the packaging is is sorted uh, sanitized uh, quality inspected and stacked before it's ready for a, a new uh, journey back to the restaurants so uh, this is now the the system we are working on and the good thing is that um, these collection points can actually accept um, packages from different packaging providers. Uh -huh. So have... this is the new part, I would say. That's, that, that's, right. that's quite unique. It's very unique, actually, compared to existing systems that you can bring 
uh, all uh, the packages, whether it's from, from uh, Vital or if it's a cup from Recup, you can bring it to the same collection points. You don't have to go back to uh, the different partner restaurants to get rid of the, the packaging. And that's why we call this the, the open, uh, Tomra open managed uh, system. Okay, Gare, as always, you make it sound and seem so easy. <laughs> but I'm quite sure there needs to be some elements in place for this to work <laughs> properly. Yeah, uh, and you are right. Reuse is, is not uh, necessarily easy. It's actually quite uh, complex. Um, so over the last year, we, uh, meaning um, my team and myself and Tomra, we have tried to understand, you know, what are the key success criteria for efficient, successful uh, systems based on reusable packaging? And we have come up with seven key requirements we believe are you must fulfill uh, to have success. Um, first of all, you need incentives for, to, to, for cafes and restaurants to actually use the system. Um, you also need a, a financial return incentive so that we as consumers have an incentive to not throw the reusable packaging in the bin, but rather return it to a collection point. And the system must uh, have a good system integrity. So it cannot be cheated and you can, from an environmental perspective, um, prove uh, the benefits of the system. That is not unique to our offering. However, the next four points in the, in the lower part of the chart here, we think are quite unique to our uh, offering. So first of all, I mean, if you're honest, reusable packaging, it's more consumer inconvenient than single use packaging. Nothing is more uh, easy and convenient than throwing a, a single use packaging into the waste bin, is it? So at least no. we have to, to, um, to uh, make, um, uh, the, the consumer convenience as, as good as we can. And one key point here, we think, is to have a dense network of automated collection points. Qu again, close to where you, where you are. Mm -hmm. uh, then we think we should keep the, uh, sort of the, con the, the user threshold as small as possible. And, and we think uh, smartphone apps, which a lot of these reuse systems you, out there use today, is, 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 is not the ideal thing. We would like, to offer a system without the need of our smartphone apps. Um, and uh, if you um, are operating with a deposit as a return incentive, you could also have a penalty as a return incentive, a monetary penalty. But if you have deposit, we think uh, the easiest and most consumer convenient way to, to implement this is to have a system where you simply um, tap your regular payment device, if that being your uh, your uh, um, uh, Google Pay system or Apple Pay Watch or your bank card. Uh, we uh, have now a system where you can do the same uh, for the reverse uh, or for the collection point. You simply tap your your payment device, uh, insert your uh, reusable packaging, and you get your deposit back within seconds onto your uh, bank card or your bank account. So that is pretty uh, consumer convenient, uh, we think. Yeah, it sounds actually fun, actually. You're, you're tapping your way into re reuse. That's, uh, yeah. that's good. So I actually don't have to take my container back to the same place that I bought it from. No. Uh, and the reason is that we simply don't think that is, uh, is con convenient enough. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I mentioned, we have, um, uh, we are now implemented this open uh, managed system. Open because, uh, it, it, as I've said, it's a system which accepts packaging from different uh, reuse providers. Um, and you can return uh, to one single collection point, different uh, packaging uh, types. Um, we call the system uh, uh, managed because uh, packages uh, and providers need to, to qualify for the system. And to give you an example, um, the packaging needs to somehow be marked. Uh, it needs to be serialized, by the way, so each packaging is unique. Um, uh, the packages obviously also need to comply with certain physical uh, limitations. So, so, so that's why uh, we call we call this a, a, an open managed system.
Okay, so so this is actually what what makes the system convenient for the consumer for me. Yes, uh, that is uh, true. Um, what I talked about in the previous slide, plus what I talked about here, I think together makes this system as convenient as reuse ever can be. And that is pretty unique with our uh, offering, we think. Yeah, it sounds like it. But but still, yeah, as you said, let's be honest, it's still a trip. I still have to, yeah, I still have to go somewhere. I have to take it back. What's yeah. going to make me want to bring this back? Well, as I alluded to earlier, you know, there are basically, well, what Tomra has learned over the last decades is that um, no incentive is more efficient than a financial uh, incentive when it comes to you know influencing uh, consumer behavior so um, here we clearly need an incentive for consumers to return their reusable packaging and basically you have two options as i mentioned either you have um, a deposit on the packaging or you could have a penalty meaning you are charged uh, automatically if you don't return the packaging uh, within the agreed uh, time of maybe one week or, 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 or uh, two weeks. In addition, we there is one more principle which I think is, is key to uh, a, a, a good system. And that is that littered packaging should, you know, if you find uh, pa reusable packaging uh, on the street corner, uh, so you could say it's it's litter, although it's not. But there should be a value to that packaging. So if 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 you bend down, pick up my litter, um, you should get the benefit. Um, and and uh, that is ensured in in our system. That is not the case uh, with all other systems uh, out there. Um, so we think that's an important principle to 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 bring from the more classical deposit return schemes for for um, beverage packaging. So, so you've mentioned it's a deposit that the consumer uh, is paying on this particular container. It's it's not a tax, it, it's not increasing the price in any way. No, no, no. Uh, so basically the deposit that I pay, I will get back in full. 100%, 100%, yeah. Okay. That That's important, yeah. Yeah, that's so true. this definitely will make me make that trip, I guess, or, uh, yeah, make that trip on the way to do something, doing something else. So that's good. Um, mm -hmm. So we've talked about everything from the consumer side. I'd like to know what is that that will make this system work wherever it is in the world? What are the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, are there yeah. technology benefits, for example? Yeah, what is important for us is, is to have a system which also um, scales well when 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 reusable packaging becomes the norm and it's not only a marginal uh, exception like it is today. So system scalability is uh, is very important to us, and we think the the um, the way uh, reusable packaging is returned today, um, which is over the counter. So so the, the default method today is that a person. Uh, takes back, uh, receives your uh, reusable packaging over the counter, uh, let's say at a cafe or a restaurant. And we think that works fine as long as the market share of, of reusable packaging is small. Uh, but when this becomes the norm and not the exception, we are totally convinced that you need automated collection points. Let the machines do the collection job. And just think about, mm. you know, taking back filthy, dirty, um, reusable packaging and at the same time, uh, serving food and, and drinks, that, that's, that's not good. And we also think that uh, where today, almost without exception, cafes, restaurants have to sanitize the reusable packaging, uh, you know, with existing uh, dishwashers, etc. We think in the future, again, when, when this becomes the, the, the norm, there is no way that restaurant owners are willing to convert a nice business to a sanitization hub, you know, investing in a lot of new dishwashers, which is, by the way, quite challenging when you are to sanitize um, plastic reusable packaging, which is also often the case today, uh, because uh, particularly drying um, plastic reusable packaging is a totally different ball game than, than hmm. washing and drying uh, porcelain, 
uh, steel, uh, etc. And also the quality assurance um, um, uh, case here is is really important to 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 you know to maintain the trust confidence from consumers that this reusable packaging which someone else um, has used previously is is really clean and, yeah. and safe to to use again. So that's also something which should be professionalized uh, and, and done in, in an industrial way and industrial scale in, in, in regional uh, sanitization hubs. So um, by offering automated collection points, professional sanitization hubs, we think we have a system which can scale. Um, and that is has been important for us. Yeah, so by getting all these uh, these things in place, uh, we think we'll have a system which is easy to use for for both the restaurants, cafes, for consumers. Um, um, you know, uh, easy, safe, um, accessible, twenty four seven. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's. Um, that has been important for us. Uh, another um, really, really as important uh, focus from from Tomra has been to design a system with with you know minimized environmental impact. And here we have engaged uh, Unomia and Andy to to help us. You know, uh, looking into how can the the um, environmental footprint uh, from these uh, reuse solutions really be minimized. So maybe Andy, are you ready to take us through some of these uh, your findings and some of your research thank you guy i'm really pleased to be here today to talk about um the work that we've been undertaking uh which is uh looking at the comparison the environmental impacts of uh, single-use packaging both paper and plastic formats when compared to the alternatives um, of reusable packaging in a reuse system as a system similar to what Guy has just described. Mm -hmm. And to date, we've been looking at um, the greenhouse gas emissions of a single use format when compared to a reuse reusable format. So essentially a cup, maybe a paper cup for coffee compared with what would happen if you had a reusable cup in a reusable system. And in the near future, we will be taking that thinking and looking specifically what it means in terms of uh, climate change impacts again in a cityscape. So using specific city models to look at that and also considering wider environmental impacts such as um, uh, littering and so forth. OK, so this is going to be interesting because I'm, I'm and I'm sure I'm not alone. You would think that a paper cup is better than anything. So this is going to be interesting. Can you bring those two together for us, single use and reusable models and, and what impact that it will have on climate change? Thanks, me too. Yeah, that, you're right. It, you know, in, intrinsically, you'd think that maybe a single use system would have a lower climate change emission. Mm -hmm. And there's some similarities, actually, in how a single use item and a reusable item actually produces emissions and contributes to climate change impacts. But there's some pretty clear differences as well, systematically, about how they work. So at the top, when you look at the single use system, um, you end up by making emissions um, by making raw materials, by producing a specific cup or package, um, by distributing those till it gets to the food or beverage vendor, and then the consumer purchases that. And all the way through to that date, you've got raw materials, production and distribution, all contributing to emissions for that single item. And then once the consumer's finished with it, that item ends up in the waste and recycling type, waste management type processes, and again, contributes to emissions, might have some benefits in terms of recycling, but generally is still a net emission for most of those items. Oh, and for each time... Yeah, correctly, if we're lucky, it lands up in the system. It might even not that's land right. up in the system, right? So, too true yeah. to, yeah, it might yeah. be lost to the environment and essentially be contributing to pollution, that's right. And for each one of those items, um, uh, essentially each, each act of consumption, each cup of coffee, you've got uh, one of those items causing emissions. So for 50 cups of coffee, you've got 50 cups all contributing to those emissions. And this is where a reuse system is similar but different. So in a reuse system, you still have all those emissions associated with producing 
um, mm -hmm. a reusable cup. In fact, actually a reusable cup is generally involving more raw materials than a single use item. So actually for that one cup, you'll end up with, for that specific item, more emissions in terms of producing the item, distributing it initially. But then it starts differing because once it goes to the consumer, um, you're, you're designing the system that reusable item comes back into the reuse system, is collected, is reconditioned, so washed, put back into the system. And clearly there's some leakage, so not every single item is going to get returned. Some might end up in the waste and recycling um, system from that one consumption, but the vast majority are going to go back through that reuse system. So in a reuse system, you have these emissions associated with making the packaging, but that's divided over many, many uses. And so although it's a higher emission per item, its consumption emission is much, much lower. Um, so one coffee cup might be used 50 times. So you can just divide the emission across all of those 50 times. And what you need to add on to that is the emissions associated with collecting those items, washing them and reinstating them. Mm. And essentially, it's just a, a different balance of these things. And our job in modeling this work is to understand what those relative differences are and essentially are there benefits or not. And we'll see some of those results as we walk through this talk. Okay, so that's a lot to think about. It's, it's, <laughs> it's over, it, I would say for me, it's overwhelming. So how did you start uh, this work? So it's it's like many of these exercises in modeling terms. We as a business undertake this work um, um, across lots of different aspects of waste management um, type work. Um, so in many of these cases, we have to build up assumptions. We have to put, put assumptions into a model to calculate the differences. Where possible, we've derived most of those assumptions from previous research, so clearly published um, estimates that are there and in use in all of this sort of work. In some cases in a reuse system, we're entering new grounds. There's things that we need to estimate. We need to make reasonable estimates, basically, based on practicality, knowledge of how these things might work, extrapolation to other systems. And we'll come to whether they, you know, the sensitivities around those and whether it, it matters or not, how accurate we are on some of those in some of the later slides. Um, another important thing is we've we, we think it's important to design the system taking assumptions in terms of near future. We're not talking about exactly what emissions would happen today because the system isn't going to be just operating today. It's important to look to the near future and various things are changing. So we're looking at a 2030 time frame for the results that you're going to see today. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we look at these systems and think, what what's the best that we can do with these systems? Practically, what is the best that we can do and make decisions around assumptions around that? So we've definitely gone through a process of looking at values, thinking about what could change and designing what we think is um, a, a good approach in terms of minimizing the environmental impact actually of both systems by 2030 for a fair comparison. And all of those results can be compared later on um, in physical trials through actual city city type implementation of these systems um, and can be refined. But we think we've got a set of assumptions that are very reasonable and likely to point very strongly to a, towards a certain set of results, which we're going to share with you in a bit. And those are key assumptions are? So key assumptions indeed. <laughs> I'm only going to give you a really quick snapshot because you'd appreciate there's lots to this and um, there's a lot of work in deriving these. But these are things that you can that that I hope you, you everyone listening to this can can start to understand that we've given everything a good, fair uh, analysis in all of this. Mm -hmm. So first off, in single use, um, we have assumed relatively low levels of paper recycling. And there's a reason for that. Partly by 2030, yes, we'd expect separate collection systems in many cities to improve. But we're talking about um, paper takeaway items, things that have been used for food. They're going to have food potentially attached to them. Mm -hmm. Drinks cups, still going to have drink <laughs> residues and so forth. Um, so partly... It, there's a question over how um, how targeted they are by municipal recycling systems, but it's also an important factor that they don't actually recycle well in municipal recycling systems that are going to be salting this material to normal mm. cardboard type recycling. And you actually don't get much benefit from recycling high wet strength items in those systems. 
um, and you probably get um, a climate change disbenefit, i.e. no benefit really from recycling those items. It's the opposite way around. So we could have put up a higher recycling rates, but it would have made the case for paper uh, single use worse, not better. And in plastics recycling, we've got a 75% recycling rate. So, you know, most people looking at that, I should think would say that's pretty ambitious for 2030, basically, that all those items would be recycled at that rate. So we've given it a really good, fair balance of assumptions for single use that we think are applicable for 2030. Okay. And... We have a slide next, which is some very key assumptions on what it means for the reuse system. So the first one, which I'm really going to highlight, and Guy talked about this earlier, um, is essentially the return rate into the system. It's really important um, for a reuse system that you get a good return rate back in there. It's important the system's designed appropriately, that it's convenient, um, and the incentive that Guy talked about is set appropriately that you get a good level of return. And that's quite key to the um, environmental performance of a reuse system. There are other aspects which I'm just going to touch on very lightly here. Um, there are aspects about what happens when these reuse items go out into the out, go out into the wider world, into the city, and essentially go home um, into the home-like environment or business environment. So we've made different assumptions depending on the item. Some of these might get directly returned, but some of them are going to go home. And in those situations, it's reasonable to assume that that, that for convenience, people will want to basically rinse some of the residues off using cold water in the case of coffee and so forth and in some cases where it's quite high food contact they probably want to wash them in a dishwasher type environment before returning them because they're going to be sitting around potentially for a while before they get returned oh. and there's another key aspect on this that various studies have um, considered values around and this is what happens if people make a dedicated journey to return these items so they've taken them home they're going to jump in their car potentially and then there's, there's some assumption that they make a dedicated journey back mm -hmm. many other studies have actually assumed very high rates of people do to taking these items back dedicated in their diesel car and so forth and we don't think that that's right we think it's reasonable to allow something for dedicated journeys and we think we've actually come up with quite a high-end estimate for that but it's important because it's contributing to emissions um, and there's a few other aspects on there, but I'm, uh, people can read them and uh, essentially, yeah, we can talk about that later in questions. Okay. So that's a lot of assumptions. And thank you for taking us through all of that um, and helping us understand where you started this process. Can you now tell us what the results were? So what are we looking at when we look at reuse and its impact on climate change? At least the model that Gaia shared with us. Sure. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to put up a chart to explain this, but I will explain <laughs> it. <laughs> um, these are the overall um, CO2 equivalent emissions for a consumption event. It might sound like a strange metric, but it does make sense. In single use, a consumption event is what use of one packaging. In reusable times, it's the basically the sale of one coffee or it's the sale of one hamburger okay. and so forth. And the green bars are showing the CO2 emissions for each item um, or consumption event uh, for the reuse system. And then the yellow bars are the same equivalent, but in single use for paper. And the light blue bars are the single use um, examples where um, it's a, pack a plastic packaging single use. So not, not used in all of these different um, formats. Mm -hmm. And you can see pretty clearly that in the individual formats, the vast majority of these, the reuse system has an emission of substantially lower than the single use equivalent. And in many cases, half or less than half. There are a few key ones that where it becomes closer, like pizza, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. But as we run through all of those, basically pizza is the only one that really comes really close to where reuse might be broadly similar um, to reusables. The rest, it's pretty clear that a 98% collection rate of those reusable items, reuse is far more beneficial in terms of climate change emissions than the single use comparators. Okay, so why is that the case? Why does reuse actually lower climate change effects? 
it's a good question and i'll try and answer it in a simple way as possible but again i'm gonna <laughs> rely you. on a, another chart i'm afraid <laughs> um it comes back to what I described earlier on in terms of why there's a difference in the system. And it's about embodied energy in those specific packages, but the amount of times that you get to reuse that embodied energy is key to all of this, plus the emissions that come from the reuse of reusable system in terms of collecting and reinstating. And what you can see, I picked out picked out just three of the formats here to show an example. And you have the reuse system over on the left-hand side and the single-use system over on the right-hand side. And you can see direct comparisons that for yeah. cold cups on the left, and then you have the cold cup single-use. In all of those, this teal color is the energy associated with producing the item in the first place. In single-use, it's only shared over one consumption event. On the left-hand side, it would have been a much bigger if it was that single item but it's shared over many events. And so you can see that you're sharing that in raw emission, the emissions from production and so forth over many more times, and it's much lower in the reuse system because of that. Stacked on top of that, in the reuse system, you have various different colors on the top there. They differ in terms of order, depending on which reusable format you're looking at here. But the main issues that are coming in there is emissions from the professional washing, so you've still got an emission. It's not climate change neutral by any means, but it, adding those on top of those raw material emissions still don't meet, don't, don't, don't result in single use being more favorable. Mm. It's just a nuance on this chart, which might not be immediately apparent. Those gr big green bars on the reusable system below can be deducted from the top of those bars, and they're the benefits from plastic recycling. So these reusable items, the majority of them end up in the recycling process when they end, uh, end up as end of life, and there is a, a benefit from recycling the plastic reusable items. So, I don't know if that, hopefully that explains why systematically there's a difference. Essentially, it's always about balancing up this raw material input into the item, mm. but how many times you use it, plus the emissions that you get out of having to wash and reinstate these, these, um, these uh, reusable items. Okay, no, that helps. Thank you. So, if I'm listening to you and, and understanding it correctly, it seems that collection is extremely important, the co collection of these materials, of these packages. Um, would you say that that's really one of the key points of this study? The, the more times you reuse these items, um, uh, the, the, the lower that emission is that's associated with the original production of those items. Yep, each time you're getting a further emission from the reusable system, but it is important to share that over many times. We've chosen a 98% collection rate yeah. as our core assumption there because we think it's reasonable. We think with a good incentive um, to return um, and a convenient system, 98% is achievable. You've got some examples in single-use beverage which are approaching that without the same level of incentive, essentially, um, and possibly uh, debatable about the convenience, but it, it feels like a, a reasonable assumption. You're only going to know for sure once these things start being trialed. Of course. You know, that's the truth of it. So what we've done is some sensitivity analysis here. And you can see that um, that actually there's still benefit for many of these formats if that 98% assumption isn't quite achieved. And you can look down the list there. The only one where you start to get really into a disbenefit quite soon is pizza and then maybe sushi a little bit lower. But bear in mind that all of these formats will be working together in a system and coffee cups and so forth. Actually, you can have much lower collection rates um, and still see a, a benefit from the reusable system. I don't think that's saying that you shouldn't target the high collection rate because, as I've already explained, the benefits are better um, mm. at those higher return rates. But basically, yeah, if, if the system doesn't quite manage 98%, it's still going to have a benefit. Okay, and this is all from the phase one that you started with. Uh, you're part of the presentation. What else are you looking at? So, really good question. Um, we think the format by format comparison that we've done so first in climate change is pretty key. Climate change is clearly a really important challenge. I think 
the next phase we we're, we're taking taking that thinking and carrying on looking at climate change but we're modeling it for very specific cities um, which will be interesting because we'll mm. essentially confirm some of the kind of assumptions that we've had around um, logistics and so forth but really importantly also we want to look at the wider ability of this incentivized kind of reuse system to manage littering and you know it was it was described earlier on by Gaia and and you were asking questions around this littering is a key issue um uh, uh it has um a cost a cost in terms of um environmental impact from loss to the environment type material that never gets comes back into a waste management system um it also has municipal costs essentially you know from people having to mm -hmm. cleanse the streets empty litter bins and so forth and crucially, it has another cost to society, which people often forget, but basically various studies have looked at this concept of disamenity cost. And this is basically a, 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 valuing, um, a valuing of what society would be prepared to pay to have a cleaner, better environment. And actually, when those surveys are uh, conducted, it, it generally places a very high value, i.e. people want a clean environment hmm. around them. Uh, and it's a wor worth something to them. So yeah, next ne next stages is to look at some specific cities and use those essentially to confirm our work and expand out on it. Especially that last point, the dis disamenity cost, that's not something that I've thought about. So very interesting aspect. Andy, thank you very much um, for showing us what some of those, your, your results have been um, and really solidifying what Gare was talking about in his concept to say, yes, it is worth it to go out and to give this a try. Um, so thank you for, for sharing that with us. And we look forward to your the phase two or the next phase of your research and to, uh, and I guess that would be also another webcast coming up, uh, sounds like. So I think you just saw the slide. Um, if you're looking for more information, please reach out to reusethetomer.com um, to get more information on this system and what Gare produced. Gare and his team have, have been working on as long as with what uh, Andy has been working on. Thank you very much for your engagement. I think we've got over 50 questions, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but I do want to, because some, some of those questions have been around the slides and the recording, I can commit to, uh, from, from our side at least, we will get those to you within the next week or so, as long as also, sorry, and, and, so, and also, excuse me, uh, answer any questions that we might not get to um, in this next Q&A session. Andy, let's look at some of the questions that came in for you. Uh, sure. We've had one uh, from Thomas. Andy, will you publish, will you or you know me, I'm guessing it's you know me, will you be publishing your study? We will, yes. Um, our intention is to publish it um, towards the end of July. Um, so there'll be a full report covering all, all the details that I put in the talk today, but uh, a lot more, a uh, lot more, lots of sensitivity analysis, lots of considering what ifs, um, and hope uh, will be a good transparent report that everyone can dig into. Good, good. We'll look forward to that. And as I said, maybe it'll be another webcast. Who knows? Um, <laughs> Um, maybe one more question while we're getting Zimon. I think Gare has, has managed to, to rejoin. That's the glory of live shows. Um, so let's hope that uh, Zimon gets back on. Um, Andy, we've had a few questions, actually a couple of questions. One, I think you may have answered, and that was in regard to the rotations. Um, and I think you answered that on slide 19. Some of those questions came in beforehand. Um, there is one question specifically from, I think, I hope I pronounced this Lowell correctly. Um, you have a number of rotations proposed. How did you come to this conclusion? Well, it's a combination of the collection rates and longevity of items in the system. Um, we've looked and entered into discussions with various providers of current reusable takeaway items and various uses of similar polypropylene packages in the catering environment and looked at the longevity, the reasonable longevity of those and came to the conclusion that they would last long enough to be able to be, be basically uh, passing through around 50 rotations, i.e. what would be achieved with a 98% collection rate. 
So everything came together really in terms of longevity of items, but also that the 98% collection rate seems pretty reasonable, both in conjunction with what current takeaway um, takeaway reusable systems are achieving, um, but also looking at single use um, deposit type ideas and the better end of collections where they're incentivized. So bringing those two things together really. Okay, and I'm, I'm just going to stick, since you've mentioned it a couple of times, um, um, the 98%, there seems to be some skepticism among our guests. How and how optimistic is this number? How did you get to 98%? Well, I think it's realistic. I mean, you know, if, if you look at deposit schemes on single use in, in Germany and so forth, you're in similar numbers with much lower incentive to actually return the item into a deposit system. I would say um, so monetarily, obviously, it's for, you know, Tomra to set it for their system and other cities to consider what would be a deposit rate. But the the kind of deposit rates that are likely to be applied to this is going to be a good incentive to return. I don't think it's a matter of people being potentially lazy and so forth. I think it's, you know, it's not only the, the people who are going to want to return, but there are others that are clearly incentivized to do so. And, you know, if they are left in the littering environment and so forth, there's an incentive for other people to potentially pick them up and return them. So they, they, they're going to be items with a value, basically. And I think, you know, it's generally been seen that items with a value do get returned into systems yeah. such as these. Yeah. And actually, you've managed to answer a couple of other questions. In that, uh, in that <laughs> oh, answer. Good stuff. Um, yeah, Zima, welcome back. Um, yeah, as we said before, or as you showed before, there's a concept, there's a model. Um, Andy shared some of the research um, that they've begun. Uh, you know me has begun on this on this model but it's not just an idea or a concept we are actually going to to do this right we are <laughs> okay yeah now actually was it 6th of june simon we tom ross signed uh, a contract with orus uh, municipality to actually uh, pilot uh, this uh, open managed system in orus orus is the beautiful city in denmark it's actually the second largest city in Denmark. Um, so yeah, uh, the idea is to, to start a pilot uh, towards the end of the year. So maybe Simon, you want to elaborate a little bit on why did you have this ambition to introduce uh, such a system? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah. And thanks for having me, by the way. What an interesting presentation from Andy as well. That was, uh, yeah, that was interesting. So yeah, a little bit about the background, why we have uh, chosen to go this path and all this is I'm in a, I'm a project manager in a circular packaging system uh, and I work in a, a small team, a development team here in the municipality called Aintby or Clean City. And um, we have a, a kind of a working vision towards having less uh, garbage cans in the city and looking into how to transition into other um, ways of, where we don't um, produce as much litter and as much waste as, as we've done. So um, when I was hired and we started looking into, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, what is in the garbage? Uh, what is the waste, uh, um, the fractions within the waste uh, in the in the public uh, garbage bins? And what we saw was, as Gary previously mentioned in his presentation, is that we have somewhere around 45 uh, to 48% of the waste generated in the public space is actually uh, packaging, uh, single-use packaging. Um, so that was the driver for, for looking into a more sustainable way of uh, utilizing packaging. Uh, another driver has um, definitely been that we also ask the citizen and all those, uh, how do they feel about transitioning into reuse instead of single use? And what we saw was was a um, a large, a very large percentage of the the, the people asked in a uh, in a large study, a quantitative study, was very very keen on on a reuse system. Um, and um, of course, we saw the legislation happening in the distance as well. So these kind of three drivers uh, were. Uh, were imperative to to the the yeah the, or, or the background in, in order why we are doing this collaboration exciting collaboration with Tomba yeah and uh, you actually ended up um, 
making a tender process uh, for uh, this system? What what uh, what made you select uh, Tomra as a supplier? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, as you said, we, we, we kind of looked at how we can manage to, to do this project in, in the most sustainable way, meaning that how we can make a pilot that also can function afterwards. And that was the tender process came into uh, perspective here. Um, and we had 11 companies from around Europe uh, uh, providing their uh, offer on this tender. So we had a, a, a very... Um, a, a large expertise uh, surrounding this and a lot of good uh, qualified um, offers on it. So why we chose Tomorrow was mostly or, or two different. It was because of the convenience, as you talked about. You have a, a, a great um, ideas of how to manage the convenience for the consumers and the cafes. And we saw that as a very attractive offer in, in that way. And also the robustness of the company uh, in in automatization and building circular systems uh, within the food and beverage uh, industry. So, so that was the main two, two things that made you uh, win the tender process. Uh, yeah. And again, thank you for choosing us. And we very much look forward to, to piloting this uh, very first system in the world, uh, working in the way we have just uh, described stuff will be Super exciting, also Very challenging, exciting but uh, super exciting, yeah. So, uh, is there good. more, more questions we should uh, answer? Oh, or? yes, we have we many have more questions. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple. Um, and as I mentioned before, we will um, get back to the questions that we cannot answer in this session within the next week. Um, so, we will do our best to answer what we can, um, along with the recording of, the, of this particular session and the slides. Um, and also we will, because we have so many questions and, and you are all being so engaging, we will extend this session by, let's say, 10, 15 minutes maximum. So if you'd like to stick around, you can. Um, so let's see how many questions we can get to. With that, we will start. Uh, lots of thumbs up and celebration. So uh, apparently people are excited. So thank you. Um, I'm not sure who can answer this one. How is reusable dine-in packaging defined in legislation? I think that was uh, this came up, Gia, yeah, when you were presenting. Do you have an idea? Otherwise, we can look into it and get back. I don't have an exact uh, answer to that question, unfortunately. May, uh, do you, Andy? I think it depends where you're asking the question as well. I think that it's reasonable to say that the definition is in progress and being developed, and there's a concept of basically is a package just capable of being reused or is it is it actually a part of a reusable system i.e there is you know a clear route for getting it back into reuse i.e it's differing between somebody who has their own coffee cup and just reuses it a number of times and ones that go back into these kind of managed type systems such as you've just described that Tom are developing mm -hmm. um, so I think the legislative clarification certainly in the EU terms are in progress and not not super clear at this moment in time. I'm not so sure for individual countries. So in Germany and so forth, there might be a better definition, but I, I'm, I'm not aware of it at the moment. I, I propose since we, we want to give an accurate answer that we take a look um, and do some research and then get back to you and, and those questions that we'll answer within the week. Um, we have a question here from Annika for Gea. Um, I'm thinking. So Tarma will take care of logistics, cleaning, redistribution, etc as well and who will manage the deposit clearing inventory management etc at the different stages yeah so in Aarhus for the pilot that is pretty clear uh, and the answer is Tomra uh, in other uh, markets geographies uh, that might be different but uh, because there are no existing um, alternatives, I would say, in, in, in orders, uh, Tomra will, will uh, take on, on the full responsibility for those functions uh, mentioned. Okay. Another legislation question. Should we, from Axel, should we consider standardization of reuse and refill systems in the PPWR, so the Packaging Packaging Waste Regulation or the proposed regulation? Mm. 
yeah, it would be certainly be beneficial uh, reuse and standardization to at least to some extent uh, uh, is a good match for efficiency. So yeah, I, I, I think I would support such an ID. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. From Merit, um, will beverage containers be included in this system? No. So bottles and cans um, will not be included in the system. Okay, but those are covered by the, let's call it traditional Correct. Uh, deposit return system, right? Co correct, yeah. Okay. Is there a reason for that, Kea? Just for the, I'm assuming for recyclability um, to meet some of the well, demands? Well, I, I know that, for example, if we, if we stick to, to Denmark, uh, the legislation if, is so, and please correct me, Simon, if I'm wrong, but we, uh, we cannot touch uh, uh, the system for um, uh, beverage packaging, packaging, use beverage packaging, uh, PT bottles and cans. So it's a... Uh, that's fair, that's correct. It's a uh, strict okay. legislation that... Uh, uh, yeah, focuses on some, yeah, yeah. Uh, cans and, uh, and bottles, yeah. yeah. So this is devising a system within um, given rules and regulations, and, and that's what we have to work with, correct? Yeah, and just okay. to sum up on that, that's also why it's very interesting to look into this in Denmark, because you have this very good uh, Danish return system that really has high return rates and such, but they can't look into these kind of single use because they're legislated within mm. their... Uh, field okay. to look at only uh, yeah uh, a box yeah okay <laughs> good thank you um, I have two questions here that might go hand in hand um, the idea of not using smartphones is great but then you need a smartphone or other device to get the forfeit I think the refund back the deposit back this is contradictory um, and then the question, second question, which sort of is related to that. What about card fees when collecting and re refunding deposits? Yeah, good, good question. Um, yeah, so as I tried to explain, but I was probably do, do, not doing my job good enough. Uh, the idea here is, uh, is a system, system where uh, if a container is checked out using deposit, the other alternative would be a penalty. But assuming a deposit and money is to be reimbursed to the consumer, the idea is to have this, uh, I, I call it tap to receive solution. So basically you are using your normal um, payment solution, maybe based on Google Pay, Apple Pay, or your bank card. Uh, and the idea is that you use the same solution. So you, for example, you tap uh, your card uh, or your watch or your phone, to this terminal on the collection point. And then uh, a few seconds later, after you have inserted your packaging, the, the deposit money is on your account. Okay. Can I, um, a, a quick follow up to that is also when sure. we had this uh, quantitative study on the citizens of Aarhus, this was actually something that they, they uh, put very high on the uh, agenda. Why, how, you know, if they wanted to use reuse system, it should be this, uh, option of, of tap uh, in and on. So that's major convenience uh, right there. Mm. And then uh, the second part of the question was uh, something Gareth, about- if I could just interrupt you just for a second, Sorry. because I know that Andy, you have a hard cut at 11. So you do need to leave. Um, we will again be reaching out with some questions for you to, to be able to support us on, on your part of the presentation. Thank you very, very much. It was very interesting. And we're looking to the rest, uh, the publication at the end of July. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 So, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we yeah. wanted to get that in. Yeah. yeah. So to the point about, uh, I think it was mentioned transaction fees for, for, for the mm -hmm. deposit payout using this method. And that is correct. However, we are in, uh, in dialogue with those companies uh, charging those transaction fees. Um, and I think they have realized that they have an important role to play in a future circular economy. Uh, for incentivized collection. And, you know, high collection rates in a circular economy uh, is, you know, super important. And Tomra has learned over many years that no incentive is as efficient as a financial return incentive, so money. So this 
industry facilitating payouts, micro payouts, they have a role to play in the circular economy. And I think they have realized that and they are willing to uh, minimize uh, their uh, transaction fees, fees, which today are significant, I would say. Mm. But they are, uh, I think they are in a transition where they, they uh, want to come down and facilitate, for example, the system now in orders with attractive transition, uh, transaction uh, cost fees. This is yet another example of collaboration that mm -hmm. we haven't seen before and everyone really trying to move or all parties trying to accelerate this transformation to a circular economy. So it's really refreshing to see words going into action. Collaboration is key for a circular economy. Clearly. Um, I think this has already been answered, but maybe you want to be again very just specific. Um, you think that people who are I'm just going to quote this now, who are too lazy to cook or go to the restaurant will not be too lazy to return the packaging somewhere. I don't think so. So <laughs> I, again, I'm just reading. I'm, I didn't make this up. <laughs> so. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I tend to think there are a couple of things affecting uh, consumer behavior. And, and uh, knowledge is one thing to know what's good and what's uh, bad, right and wrong. Another thing which is important is, is consumer convenience. That's, uh, if something is too inconvenient, you, you, I, you don't do it. But the, the third thing, which is a really power, powerful uh, parameter is the, is the incentive. And in this case, the financial incentive. So if the, in, if the financial in, the return incentive is sufficient, and the convenience is sufficient. Uh, we hope that uh, also those people will uh, return their uh, usable packaging uh, in the correct way. And this you can follow up perhaps with this, the answer to the next question. How would I get a refund when returning someone else's container? Yeah. So it goes sort of hand in hand, right? Yeah, and the simple question here is that um, if the container is checked out, uh, for example, using the uh, deposit, you simply tap your your uh, personal uh, card or device, and you get the uh, deposit reimbursed. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a lot of costs related to this approach. This again from Annika: Ma maintenance of RVMs, logistics, cleaning, making it more expensive than returning it at the restaurants, etc. Directly, who will pay for it? What's your thought? Mm. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, to make this clear, and let's be honest again, we are talking about a system where um, the cost of using a reusable, let's say, cup is higher, totally, if you, if you sum up the cost around this circle, is higher than, than the current cost of a disposable single-use cup today. Uh, on top of that, as we have mentioned, uh, the system we are describing is more uh, inconvenient than a system based on disposable packaging. Let's be honest. So for this solution to work to the best for our children, to the best for society and the environment, we are convinced that incentives are needed, uh, legislative incentives. That could be either bans, banning certain single-use items, then you don't have a choice. It could be uh, tax levy EPR fee, making the single use alternative more expensive, making the mm. reuse alternative more uh, attractive. Uh, could also be temporary subsidies for uh, the reuse alternative. Long term, we think that um, um, tax levy EPR fees, uh, that, that's the solution. Uh, to to make single-use packaging more expensive and reflect the societal costs which comes uh, with it. Um, and then uh, the hope is that the reusable alternative uh, then becomes competitive from a cost perspective. If that was sort of clear. That was sort of clear. <laughs> I think it was very clear. Thank you. Mm. Zeman, a question for you. Great stuff in Aarhus. When are you planning to start and what's the time frame for the pilot? And this is not uh, the only question related to that. So lots of curiosity out there. Yeah. Um, so this is a question as well to Gary. But uh, we're working on a time frame, but somewhere in, in 
autumn late uh, this year we will probably go live that's just, that's our ambition and uh, hopefully we will we will be able to do that yeah so i think we can say watch this space you definitely will hear about it when we start to roll things out so mm -hmm. thanks for the question uh Again, who will pay for things in the end for everything? Yeah, I think you just approached, uh, answered that question. Do you think standardization and packaging is critical in scaling reuse? Maybe that's a question for both of you. Do you want to go first, Simon? Uh, can you reiterate just so I get the question correctly? Yeah? Sure, sure. Do you think standardization and packaging is critical in scaling reuse? Well, yeah, uh, in some way it needs to be standardized. Uh, right now we're looking into uh, trying to meet the uh, criteria of the local businesses who want to work with it. But, but, but of course, there is some standardization behind that needs to happen in order to have a, uh, a system that, um, that is manageable uh, for, for Chandra. Uh, I think if you would elaborate uh, on your behalf, yeah, if you're talking about standardization or packaging, of course, it would be beneficial if all the cups were a one type, all, all the salad bowls uh, or another type. However, I don't think that's realistic. I think you will see uh, a few packaging pools provided by different providers. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't believe in 100% standardization. And if some brands want to have their special packaging uh, maybe that should be allowed but maybe also then the, the cost per circulation uh, the service circulation fee or the service fee to cover the cost Annika I think uh, was addressing should be a little bit higher to reflect the, the higher cost of having or using not non-standard uh, packaging I think an important thing to say in this pilot that we're yeah we're going to pilot now is that the standardization here in terms of uh, design and such is that it's a um, uh, easygoing design. It's not going to be uh, possible to have commercialized uh, packaging within the the first uh, years of this uh, pilot. Um, so that's some sort of standardization uh, in the beginning here. Yeah. But coming back to my point, which I made earlier regarding an open system, I think it's important to standardize in a way that we, you can maximize consumer convenience by having common collection points where you can bring different packages uh, from different suppliers too, so that we as consumers don't need to run to one uh, reuse partner with one cup and another reuse partner with another reusable bowl, let's say. Uh, that would be a nightmare. That's what we're or, trying to avoid, exactly. Yeah, yeah we're um, trying to yeah. avoid that avoid the island solutions by having this open system. To make it as, as easy as possible. Hmm. Gea, I think we have to help Toby a bit. Um, Gea, my question about getting a refund when returning someone else's container was about picking up a littered container and getting a refund. Did you that? Did you answer that? I'm not quite sure I understood. So maybe just okay. go through I it can again. Be, I can, yeah. Be more specific. yeah. So, uh, dear Toby, let's let's say you find a, a littered uh, salad bowl uh, in the park you can pick it up um, you can tap your uh, card uh, onto the collection point return the packaging and uh, the deposit will be uh, ending up in your account within seconds i hope that understood so so the person who who littered uh lost his deposit and you got it as a reward for bending down picking up cleaning up for all of us so we're and getting a thumbs a... up from somewhere i'm hoping that's that's toby that's sending the thumbs up i'm not yeah. sure so we we have seen how efficient this is in conventional deposit return schemes for for used beverage containers uh it's super efficient uh uh, and we think it's an important principle to bring also to the reuse world uh, for takeaway packaging. 
Yeah, just a quick uh, in regards also to the 98% return rate, which is ambitious. But if we look in Denmark, we have a much lower uh, financial incentive on our beer, sing- uh, beer can. I keep seeing beer cans. It's just cans, <laughs> cans and bottles. Uh, but we still have a, a somewhere around 95% return rate on those. Uh, and this is, of course, a new system that needs to be uh, adjusted and, and the citizens need to... Um, yeah, be a part of it, but but uh, in the long run, I think a high return rate with a higher deposit is, is very much possible uh, with the behavior we already have in Denmark uh, in, with our Danish return system. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take two final questions. We still have quite a few, and again, we will get back to you on these um, for the sake of time. And there are so many of you still hanging on, so you might you must be finding this very interesting and and finding uh, speakers here very very helpful. One question um, from Søren. Have you thought about the locations of the return places yet? Maybe at locations where people often head to anyway, like supermarkets? Yeah, um, we have, uh, in, in general, we think it's, as I've said, it's important to have uh, collection points where people are for convenience reasons. That could be in public space but it also could be at supermarkets. So uh, that's more than a question if the supermarkets want to be, uh, have collection points on their premises. Um, so we are very, very flexible. Simon, do you have any thoughts on this topic so far? Uh, not really. Let's see. And uh, again, I think it's about flexibility uh, and maximizing maximize convenience. Um, but I don't have any say in that, but uh, yeah, Mm. let's see if that's, yeah. Okay, one final question from, um, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Zarosh or Sarosh. How, and uh, this is an Aarhus or Aarhus specific question, how will you be able to return your container or others in your system or others? And then I think here's the clarification part. There are more systems in Aarhus than just Tomra. So I, if I interpret correctly, and I hope I am, if you have a container from another system, can you return it? And Shorosh, if, if I'm not interpreting it correctly, please send another question and we'll get back to you. Simon, will you start answering that? Or? Well, again, it's a technical question that probably you will elaborate, but as I, as I see it, uh, what, when you're talking about the open managed system, this is exactly where it comes into play. And Sarosh is uh, working in the same uh, field uh, as we are. So he, he's very knowledgeable. Oh, okay. well. um, but as I understand, and now you must correct me if I'm wrong, um, the possibility of, for example, we have uh, Clean Hub or Vital or New Loop, these kind of providers and packaging system, if they agree to standardize within some uh, dimensions of their packaging and, and QR coding, then it's possible for them to be able to drop them into the Tomo containers as I, RVMs, uh, as I understand. But but uh, And that's the open managed system that we're aiming for, because as Tomo uh, Scare said, uh, it's not when it's not a, it shouldn't be a monopoly uh, on on packaging. It, it should just be a standardized system that can ensure mm-hmm. the collection rates and and the convenience of these different providers, packaging providers. I think yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say the same, uh, Simon. So that's the that's the long term uh, ambition. What what will be the case uh, short term when we start up uh, towards end of this year remains to be seen. But yeah. Uh, that's that's a long-term uh, ambition you just described correctly. Oh, and maybe I can again. This is also technical, so yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. But, but in the end, in the beginning, we're also starting with a standardized uh, packaging that we're, that we are providing, you're providing, but we are designing uh, together in order to make it as simple as possible for the consumer and the restaurants in the beginning to to know that this is the cup. This is this is the cut, mm. but, but as you said, uh, long term, this is the uh, yeah the goal. Yeah. Good. So with that, uh, we will close the session for today. We still have lots of work ahead of us in answering some of those questions that are out there. Thank you, Zimon, and thank you, Gea, uh, for yeah, a very very interesting session. Me.
Um, it was very interesting. We could tell by the questions that were coming in. People really, uh, we got one now have fab session that doesn't get much better than that. So thank you. And thanks to the guests who are still here and there are still amazingly a lot of you here. So we will get back to you. Thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, again, it's reuse at tamara.com. Thanks very much and have a good day. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bye. thanks. Bye.